SCP-001, The Queen's Gambit. The Factory 001 proposal is a classic one, a short tale written in the early days of the SCP Wiki which attempted to expound on the origins of the SCP Foundation. In it, a man creates a massive factory built to create everything from weapons to food, and then some. The man begins creating anomalies and experimenting on his tortured workers, until eventually the founders of the Foundation lead a rebellion and take over the place. Some years later, the factory was attacked in mass by fairies who quickly overpowered the budding Foundation. To save their lives, the founder went to the bowels of the factory, finding the remains of the man who built the place. He gave them the power to defeat the fairies, in exchange for being fed continually. They defeated the fairies, but they continue to feed the factory to this day. It's a good little tale, but it is short and lacking some details. That brings us to this 001 proposal, an attempt to take some of the plot points from the factory tale and rewrite it in a whole fleshed out story. Let's begin. The object class for SCP-001 is listed as Thaumiel originally, but this has been striked out pending reclassification. Whatever it was, the Foundation was using it to help with their goals, but something changed. SCP-001 actually refers to three interrelated phenomena, the first of which is an industrial megastructure located 75 kilometers north of Krakow, Poland, founded and overseen by James Rolander. The megastructure acts as the main provider of a plethora of services to the entire country of Poland and most of the continent, housing approximately 30,000 laborers who work and live within its confines. Atop the front gates, written in the language of the Fae, are the words, The Factory Hungers, as the Queen's move has become her last gambit. Do not leave it in famine. The second part of SCP-001 is a specific room located within this megastructure, which can only be found once an individual expresses the wish to find it, either willingly or subconsciously. So far, attempts to mark it in relation to any other rooms or landmarks have been unsuccessful, with all individuals coming into contact with it describing drastically different details of the place and the path which led them to it. The third part of SCP-001 is an entity located within this room, fed by human sacrifices delivered to it by James Rolander. Further details regarding its nature are presently unavailable. The megastructure, or the factory, was constructed by a currently unidentified group of individuals or force between 1898 and 1902, although no formal records regarding its construction exist. It was created to be the ultimate factory, meant to supply every single possible industrial need of the people. We're given a side note expanding on James Rolander, who was born in 1860 to a wealthy American family mainly settled in New York. James was an only son, and was always meant to inherit the family fortune and their industrial empire after his parents' death. He was highly interested in both the history of the Fae and the Children of the Night SCP-1000, since childhood, and had displayed an above average intelligence, near perfect memory, and skill in obtaining historical information otherwise thought to be undiscoverable. When a majority of his family died under unexplained circumstances in 1888 during a fatal shipboard incident however, he donated all of his stocks and buildings to an unknown thaumaturgic cabal operating in the USA. The next day, he was seen leaving America on a ship headed for Great Britain, later traveling to Poland. Witnesses of the event reported him acting highly paranoid and erratic, as if he were afraid someone was observing him, and holding an unidentified tome within his hands. 
He disappeared afterward for approximately 10 years before reappearing in 1898 near Krakow with the construction of the factory starting shortly after. It came to the foundation's attention specifically in 1908 after exceedingly high levels of thaumaturgic energy were intercepted from it. This energy did not fade over time, instead remaining at a consistently high level. This is currently theorized to be the date of origin for the anomalous room inside of the factory, and this event sparked a visible period of the highest productivity to date, ultimately resulting in unprecedented profits and the expansion of Rolander's nascent empire. To eliminate the possibility that the event was merely a coincidence, further research was approved, ultimately resulting in the discovery of the ruins of numerous palaces and city structures in the caverns below the factory. Dated at approximately 200,000 years old, they were immediately identified as structures formed by the Fey Empire prior to its fall. Despite the inherent anomalous properties of these ruins, it was eventually discovered that they had not been involved with the thaumaturgic event, which had instead been the result of some form of ritual conducted within the factory. Following these discoveries, the Foundation officially classified the factory as its first full high-priority project following the adoption of the SCP classification, resulting in it being designated as SCP-001. Of course, the Foundation wanted to learn more about what was happening in this factory, so they sent in a task force, because none of the factory's employees had been seen leaving the place within the last month. Upon entry into the factory, however, the task force immediately lost contact with the Foundation. This happened a few times, until the Foundation decided to stop sending people in and instead try to research the ruins underneath the factory, led by O5-4, their resident anomalous history expert. Before we get into that though, we're given another side note concerning the history of conflicts between the Fae, the Children of the Night, and humanity, as compiled by O5-4. At some time prior to 300,000 BCE, consensus baseline reality achieved stability, as the result of numerous religious faiths being simultaneously true, due to human belief bestowing power upon them. Old gods and numerous other deific entities presumably responsible for the creation and destruction of the era fade away, leaving Earth to its own machinations. Around 300,000 BCE, humans, Fae and Children of the Night emerge as the three dominant species on the planet, evolving from one common evolutionary predecessor. As humans live on the plains during the day, the Fae hide in the forests, and the children live in caverns. Around 280,000 BCE, a fairy named Mab and her sister are born, whose name has been removed from existence. The two utilize their nigh-limitless ontokinetic and thaumaturgic abilities to establish a vast empire, connecting all Fae as one nation ruled by the two of them. 5,000 years later, the two queens' control over their abilities grow, and the Fae Empire expands worldwide, taking control over both humans and the children. The humans are put into gigantic habitats, unaware of their situation, and observed by Fey royalty as entertainment, while the children's cities are destroyed and they are sent to the darkness of the mines to work as slaves. The divide between the working class of the Fey and the aristocrats continues to grow. This builds until around 240,000 BCE, when an all-out war breaks out between two factions of the Fey with Queen Mab standing on the side of the aristocracy and her sister on the side of the working class. Unfortunately, Queen Mab is far more powerful than her sister, and the war swings in her favor. Exploiting the chaos, the Children of the Night break free, 
uniting with humanity to raid the royal palaces. Queen Mab murders her sister, but temporarily loses her powers in the process, allowing the rebellion to eliminate her. The Fey Empire falls, and the Children of the Night become the dominant species. They go on to create vast, technologically advanced metropolises. Through unknown means, Queen Mab survives between several afterlives, eventually gaining insight into baseline reality. Around 210,000 BCE, Queen Mab persuades humanity to overthrow the children, lending them some of her remaining power. They eventually destroy the children's civilization, later wiping their own memories of the event. Humanity becomes the dominant species on Earth, and the remaining Fae scatter across the globe, maintaining an extremely low population in order to not allow Mab to gain further control. In his analysis of the ruins beneath the factory, O5-4 says that when he first arrived, he was expecting the usual findings of such a place, that being yet another gigantic ruined palace of Mab destroyed by the rebellion. In a sense, he was right, as it was another fortress belonging to Mab, but what they found inside was shocking. They uncover secret after secret, and after months of work, they have come to one final conclusion. Mab is still out there somewhere, biding her time, just like her sister. They always thought that the sister died in trying to stop Mab, but evidence recovered from these ruins single-handedly debunks this. What's even more shocking is that the sister is not only alive, but also active, with her own cults trying to resurrect her, just like Mab. They also discovered some names for the two sisters. Not true names, as the sister doesn't even have hers anymore, but descriptive names in the Fey language. Names given to Mab translate to Queen and Starlight, while names given to the sister translates to Inventor and Factory. They also found evidence of the ritual that caused the large spike in thaumaturgic energy in the factory, leading to its massive increase in productivity. They discovered a single sentence woven into the rituals binding that anomalous room into the factory, which translates to, Come inventor, come our factory. The queen is ready, do not leave her waiting. It appears that Rolander quite literally called forth a factory in order to resurrect the true factory through regular human sacrifice. What's more, the rituals that Rolander performed seem to only be two parts of a three-part performance. Whatever he did was just preparation for bringing a third thing, presumably an entity, into our reality. Obviously, the Foundation wants to avoid Mab returning to our reality and returning to power at all costs, as the last time she was around, humanity was in a far worse position. The Foundation's best thaumaturgist wouldn't stand a chance against her, but her sister could, and they need to use that to their advantage. O5-4 believes that the anomalous room inside of the factory is a throne room designed to host royalty. Whatever entity resides there, he can feel its hatred for Mab pumping through the veins of the factory, and he knows of only one entity that hates Mab more than the Children of the Night, her sister. They have to use this opportunity as best as they can, unless they want to risk the genocide of humanity. So, to summarize all that, we have two fairy queens, each opposed to the other despite being siblings. Mab represented power, authority, and deceit, while her sister represented aid, creation, and invention. The two fought a war with one another, as Mab represented the nobility and the aristocracy, 
while her sister fought for the poor and the downtrodden. Both sisters were believed to have been killed at some point, but it seems that neither were completely slain, and in fact there are cults on both sides trying to bring them back to our reality. Rolander apparently is part of one of these cults, as he's been interested in fey history and culture since childhood, and seemingly performed a ritual to bring back the sister, using her to power his colossal factory. The Foundation isn't pleased about any powerful reality benders coming to our reality, but, as usual, the enemy of their enemy is their friend. Not completely, however, as there's still the issue that their teams sent into the factory itself never returned, and Rolander isn't speaking to them. Two months following their research into the ruins, info regarding it was leaked by an unknown individual to the worldwide anomalous community. As a result, Fey militia organizations were seen taking interest in the factory, including those in support of bringing back Queen Mab. In the coming weeks, their squads were noted to patrol the outskirts of the factory, trying to gain access. They eventually did so, proceeding to sabotage the factory and heavily damage it. To counteract the damage, Rolander decided to double the amount of human sacrifices he was giving to the sister in her throne room, resulting in an extremely high disappearance rate among workers within Krakow and surrounding cities. This led to local authorities gaining interest, so the administrator of the foundation sent an urgent message to Rolander, essentially telling him to cut it out with the human sacrifices or they're going to have to come in with force to put a stop to it. Two days later, the O5 Council received a reply from Rolander, although it's unclear how he knew where they were located. The message is quite a bit less civil, and seems fairly unhinged, reading, Silence, foul creatures of darkness. My noble heart shan't listen to your laughable heresies. I can hear the Queen speaking through your words. And I want you to know one thing. I am no Starlight's servant. I swore loyalty to only one inventor, to one brilliant mind illuminating the skies with its genius like your star had never had. I forgive your vengeful hearts serving Mab, for the Creator forgives, unlike your Queen. Be gone, whilst your armies can still walk. My masterpiece is almost done, and I shan't stop with its preparations. If you wish for a war with our magic, then you shall have it. The factory is almost ready to emerge, and once it does, her brilliance shall overpower the darkness your empress wished for the entire world. You cannot stop the rituals feeding her for the inventor can feel your every move. She whispers to my ear, illuminating my mind with a portion of its brilliance, and I know of all you do, of your horrid servitude to the betrayer of the men of this earth. May the skies above us have mercy on you. You will not stop us. So much for enemy of my enemy, I guess. Immediately after sending this message, Rolander tripled the intake of workers into the factory, effectively tripling the ratio of human sacrifices to the sister. He also neutralized numerous Mab-aligned Fey organizations, bringing their bodies into the factory for purposes unknown, and utilized numerous thaumaturgic rituals within the factory, disallowing entry into the building without his direct permission. Finally, he hastened the shipment of unknown thaumaturgic and theological apparatus into the factory. The Foundation was in a bit of a pickle, as they wanted the aid of the sister to help them stop Mab should she return, but they also couldn't tolerate having Rolander around to muck things up. The O5 Council got together to take a vote on whether or not to forcibly take control of the factory 
and establish a site within, maintaining control over the sister while also maintaining secrecy. The administrator leaves a note in which he says that years ago, when he brought the 13 talented mages and theologists that would eventually become his counsel before him, he swore that he would never resort to meaningless violence. For all these years, he stayed true to his promise, even if he was among the few that did keep it. Never has he approved an operation that would result in the deaths of people who didn't need to die for the world to become safe, but times have changed. He never would have thought that he would approve or even suggest a military raid that would result in the deaths of factory workers to contain a single threat, but it must be done. They simply cannot allow themselves to lose the only known mechanism to defend against Mab, and they must strike quickly and ruthlessly in order to keep Mab away from baseline reality. Such are the demands the greater good makes upon them, no matter their personal opinions. In the end, seven, including the administrator, vote yes on the plan, five vote nay, and two abstain, including 05-4. Following the vote, the military operation to take over the factory began as soon as possible. The only transcript we have of what all happened is taken from the administrator's memory, who was present when they approached Rollander in his office. Curiously, the administrator's name is listed as Error, and it mentions that there are numerous mimetic triggers present within his memory to protect him. This was the only mimetic trigger-free memory of the event available. It begins with 05-8 standing outside the entrance to Rollander's office, her hands extended near the door, and she is visibly struggling in deep focus. She opens her eyes, revealing a deep, burning purple color, and then tears the doors apart with visible exhaustion. The office is extremely large and packed with numerous bookcases, chests, and containers, with magical items of unknown purpose scattered throughout. In the corner, Rollander is cowering behind a large wooden desk. He is shivering, with a shadow formation akin to a crown forming above his head, and he attempts to hide from the group of three while sobbing. 05-8 bellows out his name, causing him to scream and fall to the ground. The shadows above him start to disappear, and upon noticing this, Rollander panics and attempts to grab at them, failing. He then starts to panically look around him on the floor for something, but finds nothing. 05-8 steps forward and tells him to answer for his crimes. Rollander throws a book at her, who easily deflects it with her telekinetic power, and she then snaps her fingers, causing him to levitate off the ground. Rollander struggles, mentioning that she said it will end differently. 058 then smiles, clenching her fist, causing Rollander to choke. He suddenly then falls to the ground, his eyes burning with a bright green and he begins moving towards 058. In a hoarse tone, he says that the light of the Thousand Dawn Empire shall not fade, but he suddenly cuts himself off and falls to the ground, his eyes return to normal. 058 begins using her abilities to thrash Rollander against the wall as her nose starts to bleed, until the administrator yells at her to stop. By the time she does so, she's bleeding from every orifice, although she doesn't seem to notice. She turns towards the administrator, who quietly asks what the hell's gotten into her, as they can't just murder people. 058 simply responds that he can't murder people, before grabbing her head and groaning, muttering that something is here. 054 then grabs Rollander by his jacket and spits on him, as Rollander silently sobs. 4 tells him that 
he disgusts him, and he begins carrying him out of the room. As he is about to leave though, Rollander's body suddenly explodes with shadows and smoke, causing Four to drop him as a singular green eye blinks from within the expanding smoke. A voice comes from within the smoke, speaking in a hoarse tone, saying, Come home, my child. Come home and suffer no longer. The smoke then clears, revealing that Rollander's body has disappeared, leaving only his clothing behind. 054 tells the administrator that he should tell people that the factory has fallen. The SCP Foundation took control of the factory in the aftermath, and another meeting of the council was arranged. During the meeting, they discussed further containment and research plans regarding the factory, eventually landing on the necessity of a site within the area to properly contain it. It would eventually become the main hub of operations for the council, and their most important project, SCP-001. Following the stabilization of the threat of potential civilian discovery of the anomalies here, the Council decided that research into the true nature of the Throne Room and the Sister, as well as determining how much the Sister could protect them from MAB, was a priority. It was soon determined that, despite the Sister being half dead, she was still connected to numerous Fey Seers and Thaumaturgists across the world and was still capable of communication. Unfortunately, attacks from local Queen Mab affiliated militias did not stop in the aftermath, instead increasing in frequency. The Foundation attempted contact with said groups on numerous occasions, but the only answer they ever received was, you will not bring her back, not after everything we've done to try to stop it. Foundation moles situated within various anomalous communities around the world picked up chatter regarding a fey army like the world has never seen since the dawn of Mab that was gathering to attack the factory. This was initially dismissed as just a rumor, but eventually the Foundation tripled their security measures around the factory after numerous previously stationary fey groups went on the move. In the meantime, research into the sister was officially approved. After months of analysis, it was officially confirmed that providing human sacrifices to the sister did in fact reduce Queen Mab's presence in baseline reality. They then decided to perform some tests to try and communicate with the sister. A singular red apple was transported to the throne room via thaumaturgic rituals, resulting in no response whatsoever. An apple was then brought by a D-class, resulting in everyone inside of the site hearing the phrase, more sacrifices, inside of their heads. A dead dog was then delivered, resulting in the phrase, alive blood. So a living dog was delivered, at which point she simply said, more. The Foundation then decided to quit messing around, and they just sent in a D-class to be sacrificed, resulting in everyone hearing, I am the call of the heavens, bringing down gifts of intellect to the minds of the worthy. More sacrifices were provided causing the sister to say quite a bit more of similar statements, such as, I fend off the evils of darkness and fear lurking in the shadows of starlight, and feed me so we can together kill Mab, this time forever. Eventually, she just repeated, feed me, after every sacrifice, so it's unclear how long the Foundation continued this. Noteworthy is the fact that all of the bodies sacrificed to the sister seemed to lack any characteristic traits, and no one looking at the bodies were able to identify them, despite their physical composure not having changed. In other words, their names, and thus identities, were taken from them. 
Eventually, that epic fey army did appear, manifesting in a thaumaturgic ritual around the factory. A site-wide alert was immediately called, and the council was evacuated to the lower levels. A distress call to other Foundation sites was attempted, but none would arrive in time due to this being the only site in Poland. Before the attack initiated, the Foundation were able to eavesdrop on some of their conversations, although much of it is corrupted due to the high instability of the ritual. Two fairies seem to be discussing that this whole plan is insane, even though they can't allow the Foundation to bring her back, no matter the cost. One of them mentions a greater good, while the other says that there's no such thing, and he's exactly like her zealots if he believes that there is. Around this time, all personnel within the factory reported hearing a voice similar to that of the sisters, both screaming with fear and laughing simultaneously, although research into this event revealed the source to be non-existent. Eventually, 100,000 Fey gathered around the factory, ignoring and bypassing all anti-teleportation and anti-magic defense mechanisms set up by the Foundation, and immediately began to storm the site. The only memory we have of the event, again from the administrator, is heavily corrupted, so it's unknown how much of the material here, if any, is true. The administrator is frantically running through the numerous corridors of the factory, constantly looking back to see if anyone is following him. All around him lie numerous corpses, some of them with broken necks, as apparently SCP-173 got loose. He eventually finds a dead end he can hide in, and he covers his mouth, trying not to make a sound. Footsteps can be heard from the outside hallway as he starts to sob, attempting to remain silent. A voice in Fay asks where he went, and says that he could have already found the Queen. They need to find him, as they're not about to fail her for the second time. They walk away as the administrator collapses on the ground, grabbing his head in his hands. He starts to sob as the sounds of screams, flesh being torn, and metal clanging against metal fill the air. Later, the administrator is still sitting down, sobbing and trying to stay immobile, but he's no longer in the same space. He's now in a short corridor, ending in gigantic green doors, which stand open. Green smoke is pouring out of the doors, and from within the room a silent whisper akin to that of an animal calls out to him, beckoning him to come. He suddenly starts to walk towards the room, and the smoke fills his vision. From within the smoke he sees a singular green eye blinking once and illuminating the room with its bright light. The voice asks what he seeks with the light that illuminates the skies of the Millennium Empire. The administrator hesitates at first, but then his expression changes to completely still, as a green spark appears within his right eye. He tells the voice that he wishes to seek shelter from his enemies and to save his people, but the voice asks what he truly wishes for. The room is suddenly filled with thousands of eyes, observing him from every single corner. Both of his eyes start to burn with a bright green. He then says that he wishes to destroy his enemies, utterly and thoroughly, so that none of them remain. He wants to wipe them out like the maggots they are bringing back his dominion over them once again. He then starts to sob again, grabbing his head, until his face turns expressionless again. The voice asks who his enemies are, and he responds that they are the servants of the Queen, the zealots of the eternal starlight upon the skies of the Endless Kingdom, wishing to bring their monster back from the dead. The thousands of eyes 
then start to smile. And the voice says that it shall be done. Later, the administrator is standing on the balcony directly above the factory's entrance, a feature that didn't previously exist, with 052 and 058 beside him. His eyes are burning with a green light, and in his hands, a long stone similar in shape to a wand can be seen. He is pointing it at the open hills beneath him, upon which thousands of Fae are standing with various forms of weaponry in their hands. The administrator smiles and starts to speak, his deafening voice filling the horizon. He tells the army that, for millennia, they and their queen have reigned supreme, as the horrors of their rule filled the night sky they illuminated with hatred. For countless eons, they've taken what was not theirs to rule, bringing it to their own kingdom as sacrifices to the one they call God. The entire crowd starts to look around, deeply confused, until their attention is brought back to the administrator as blank expressions fill their faces. He continues, saying that for years uncountable, they've exploited this world and its people for their monstrous empress, feeding the eldritch monster of a ruler she was. He whispers a few inaudible words to himself, and the terrain around the army starts to shake as he tells them that no more shall it be so. The entire crowd suddenly starts to scream as a gigantic vortex forms in the ground beneath them. Animal-like cries can be heard as the countless vocalizing fey fall on the ground, screaming in agony as their bodies start to transform into numerous animal-like humanoid beings, retaining their original clothing. In the middle of the vortex, a portal, black as night, appears, sucking those present into it as more and more of them sob in pain, their transformations continuing. Seconds later, a number greater than what was originally standing in the hills falls into the forming hole as the portal closes. A silent scream fills the local area as the sky smiles for a second before blinking again into non-existence. 05-2 looks at the administrator with a terrified expression, asking what he's done, to which he responds, exactly what needed to be done. What exactly he did, or rather what Mab's sister did while controlling him, was wipe out approximately 75% of the fey population on the planet. More specifically though, these fairies were sent into the forest that would come to be designated as SCP-4000. They were stripped of their names and identities, and are effectively removed from Earth. It's a little surprising that 75% of the total Fey population were in support of Queen Mab, but we'll get to an explanation later. After the whole situation was cleaned up, another O5 Council meeting was arranged, although many of the members were either dead or severely injured so only four of them plus the administrator are present. The administrator arrives late to the meeting, and upon entry, 054 marches towards him and angrily asks what he's done. The administrator doesn't respond, instead simply sitting at the table and beginning to look through documents. 054 comes up to him again, shaking his shoulders and asking what he's done to which the administrator sighs and says that he chose the lesser evil. Four says that he is actually insane, and when the administrator tries to remind him of who he's talking to, Four pushes him and swears, saying that he just murdered almost an entire race. He then takes a swing at him, but the administrator avoids it and hits him instead, knocking him to the ground. The administrator's eyes glow with a faint green, and above his head, for a brief moment, a shadow formation reminiscent of a crown forms. 
4 stands and tries to hit the administrator again, interrupted by 05-2, who tries to calm the situation down. 4 asks the others how they can stand idly by, knowing what he's done, and he looks back to the administrator, telling him that they swore to protect humanity when they banded together 40 years ago, and he'd call all of them hypocrites, but that wouldn't reflect even a part of his hatred for them. Maria Jones, head of record keeping for the Foundation, stands up and shouts at 054 to stop. 4 complies, sitting down with his face in his hands, and the administrator tells him that it would be in his best interest to remove himself from this room. 4 stands and begins making his way out, as the administrator tells the others that what he did, he did because it was the only way out of that situation, and there was no other way. He realizes what he's done, and he will not try to defend himself, but this was for the greater good. 054 says that if he really believes in such a thing as the greater good, then he's a bigger fool than he ever expected. The administrator threatens him if he doesn't leave and Four spits on the floor, tells him that he disgusts him, and walks out. Afterwards, 054 was removed from the SCP-001 project, and was relocated to a site in North America. The overall event didn't sit well with many in the Foundation, with resignations reaching their highest recorded rate. Espionage and betrayal amongst Foundation personnel increased by almost 10%, and overall efficiency was down by approximately 40%, even two years after the event. There was also severe decrease in mental stability among numerous Foundation staff, including Maria Jones and especially the Administrator, who was seen engaging in highly uncharacteristic behavior. Examples include making erratic decisions without council authorization, visible obsession with the occult and fey history despite little to no previous interest in such, paranoia and trust issues, and patterns of talking to himself on seemingly nonsensical subjects. This culminated with the administrator's disappearance, the only evidence left behind being a note on his desk which reads, it had never been the inventor. How could I have been so blind? Evidence of magical energy was detected leading towards the throne room from the administrator's office, and Foundation thaumaturgists were able to reconstruct a visualization of what occurred. He's seen standing in a short and dimly lit corridor, panting. He's holding the same stone he had used to wipe out the fairies, pointing it at the gigantic green doors in front of him. The entire area is filled with fog and sounds of clockwork tuning in the background, as well as voices similar to those of former factory employees. He yells out at something for being a monster, and then opens the green doors with visible difficulty. As he finishes doing so, powerful wind starts to blow from inside making him back off. He points the stone at the inside of the room, while green fog is rolling into the area around him. He then says, We fed you, and grabs his head in his hands as the sound of something stirring within the room fills the air. He screams with pain and falls to the ground, as a voice laughs. He asks it what it even is, before breaking down in tears, letting go of the stone. The voice chuckles and asks in return if that truly matters. The administrator is lifted from the ground as green fills his eyes, making him scream again. He's pulled into the throne room, and animal-like fur starts to cover his entire body. His face distorts, visibly deforming and his screaming eventually turns into the gurgling of a hog. He tries to reach for an exit, but his hands slip away as they turn into hooves. 
his fully converted body then begins to twitch violently, and the visualization ends. Afterwards, it seems that no individual matching the administrator's name was ever a part of the foundation, and they decided that these errors with his name must just be a side effect of the sister's presence. Since the administrator seemingly just disappeared entirely, he's now presumed dead. Further research into the fairy population determined that despite 75% of them being seemingly murdered, the rest formed their own communities within various anomalous nexuses and free ports around the globe. The foundation decided it was best to not make contact with them at this time. Eventually, the O5 Council came together for another meeting, although no one took the place of the administrator. Only eight of the council members are present, and all of them look visibly tired and saddened. O5-11 says that the administrator is dead, along with that position, and O5-4 says that so too are the defenses for what he's done. 11 says that they messed up, and they need an administrator and a way to fix this mess. The rest of the council responds only with silence, until O5-2, a mechanite, says that one must be objective in order to be just, and humanity is unable to be objective. O54 responds that he's not going to give a mechanite power over the rest of them, and that wasn't the deal with his master when they built him. O51 then clears his throat and says that he will take the position. No matter how they think about it, the position of administrator isn't a blessing and he's the only one here who's too tired to use that curse in any way that would destroy them. No one objects, so he becomes the new administrator. He immediately throws some documents onto the desk, explaining that those are the numbers for the results of the mass fairy killing. He says that these are relevant because they need to fix what they've done, as even if the administrator had done the killing, they were one of the reasons that it happened, and he's not about to allow his first action to be avoiding the consequences of their crimes. O511 says that they should find the remaining fairies and make sure that they're protected, so perhaps one day they might even not want to kill humanity. The council discusses the presence of several of these nexuses, and whether or not there might be fairies present there. O52 says that they cannot just start making sites in free ports, and O51 agrees that they need to take their time with this. O54 agrees, saying that they have time, 60 years at least. O51 says they can't just make this a one-time thing, but rather they have to actually work to change their directives. No one else in the foundation can know that they're planning on being more friendly with anomalies, as resignations would increase even more. They decide to put it to a vote, with the proposal being to locate every single free port across the globe in an attempt to find and aid the remaining members of the fairies. They will also expunge all information about the massacre and prevent another one from occurring through any means necessary, including the containment of Queen Mab through continued sacrifices to the sister. All eight council members present vote yes, and all foundation resources are made available to ensure this proposal's proper maintenance. To ensure the continued compliance of foundation personnel and to not bring about any large scale resignations, the full process was projected to take over 70 years to complete. O52 calculated that the best way to go about this was to integrate Fey and SCP-1000 cultures into human societies and structures, slowly and gradually, eventually leading to total integration and perhaps the removal of the foundation as a factor altogether. Unfortunately, not all of the fairies agreed with the foundation's new position, 
with the most active being the remnants of Mab's followers that survived the Great Massacre. They formed an organization known as Triumvirate, a corruption of a fey word meaning, we will prevail. On the date of the group's creation, they sent a message to all personnel at the factory, in which they state that it's funny to see the Foundation believing themselves to be in control. They have seen this attitude ever since they formed in the bowels of the earth hundreds of thousands of years ago, and they called it hubris. Hubris was the downfall of everything humanity has built and ever will build. They go on to say that they are the harbingers of the Foundation's inevitable and painful death and that there's a certain irony in their situation. It will be quite fun to watch them realize the obvious truth, but none of that really matters, as the fairies are growing in numbers, and growing fast. The massacre left more of them than the Foundation thought, and they'll soon find that out the hard way. Until then, they will be patiently waiting. In light of this, the Council decided that Queen Mab was still a definite threat to humanity's existence, and despite the Administrator's death, as well as the ethical concerns, they needed to keep moving forward. In the end, they decided that human sacrifices needed to continue, so thirteen humans would be offered up every week. In order to cause the least amount of damage to the Foundation, however, they decided to use SCP-2000 to create these humans on a regular basis. Despite all this, numerous Foundation personnel were dissatisfied with the ethics of this, as well as the overall ethics of working with a deity. In response, O51 sent out a message to all personnel that knew about the procedure, explaining that they are not, in fact, giving a god what it wants. What they're doing is merely making sure that the sister of said god doesn't massacre them, and giving it corpses is frankly the only thing they can do. They can't fix the past, but they just might be able to make the future a little brighter. To do that, they cannot allow Mab to repeat what they've done slaughtering a population for a fourth time. The only way to make sure that doesn't happen is through offering up sacrifices. He says this with a heavy heart, but the ritual remains as it is, because it must. With current information, it's believed that the total fulfillment of the Foundation's new directive to protect the fairies will be possible by approximately 1980, with containment of Queen Mab indefinitely sustainable. A few years later, however, in 1918, a member of the Site-01 maintenance team fell victim to an incident involving the throne room. At the ending of his shift, he entered into the room, despite claiming to have possessed no will to find it. Further research revealed that this was due to the cleanup crew's leadership forgetting to relay the anti-influence pills, which each team member is required to take daily to protect them from the sister. After entering the room, the technician was able to escape from the room due to a sudden awakening of previously dormant, reality-bending abilities, effectively becoming the first recorded person able to leave unaffected. He remained within the corridors through which he found entry into the room for the remaining of his shift, only discovered two days later by patrolling guards. He was extremely dehydrated, exhibiting signs of extreme paranoia, fear, and anxiety, and refused to answer any questions. Following numerous hours of the appliance of calming rituals and treatment, however, he began to respond to simple questions. An interview took place, although, curiously, the interviewer is listed only as error, similar to that of the former administrator. The technician is laying in a fetal position on a bed, shaking and looking around frantically. His eyes are swollen from hours of crying and two days of not sleeping, and he is mumbling incoherently to himself. 
The interviewer asks him what he saw, causing him to frantically look over the interviewer, and he tries to speak before breaking out in sobs. The interviewer yells out his name and grabs him by the arms, causing him to focus slightly. The interviewer asks again what he saw, and after some prodding, he responds that he saw the name of the beast within the room. The interviewer continues to prod him again and again, asking what the name was, until finally, in between sobs, the technician says that it was Mab. So, as you may have expected, the big reveal is that the Fairy Queen they have locked up inside of the factory and are regularly providing human sacrifices for is not, in fact, Mab's sister, but is Mab herself. There are a lot of clues that build up to this, some more obvious than others. For one, Mab was known as a Queen of Lies and Deceit so it's certainly not above her to impersonate her own sister for her own gain. Secondly, Foundation historians note that Mab possessed the power to take away someone else's name, which she used during her war against her sister. The fairies that were destroyed while attacking the factory had all of their names taken from them, something that Mab was capable of doing third is a bit more specific to the actual formatting of the document. Whenever someone speaks of a nameless fairy across the SCP wiki, they do so in vague terms, without mentioning them by name, as fairies have power over names. When this is done, the text appears in a different color, generally green. Throughout this document, whenever someone who knows that the entity is in fact Mab mentions Mab's sister, the text appears in green, as she is nameless. The same does not occur when they refer to Mab, as she is not nameless. This happens even when Mab herself mentions her sister, but calls her Mab to fool the Foundation. This is a more subtle but interesting clue. Finally, perhaps the biggest clue before the end, is the administrator's note in which he says it had never been the inventor, meaning that the entity had never been Mab's sister. Unfortunately, due to various reasons, the Council had never become aware of this revelation, and instead continued to supply Mab with sacrifices, empowering her. The Fae in the SCP universe have had plenty of articles written about them, from various perspectives, but generally they are presented as a downtrodden group, defeated and discarded in various ways by different species. That is not to say that they are necessarily good, and the Foundation has every reason to keep them out of sight, but there's no doubt that they've been through the ringer more than perhaps any other anomalous species. You have to hand it to Queen Mab, though, for not only getting the Foundation to wipe out the grand majority of her enemies for her, but also to keep protecting and feeding her along the way. Chances are, though, the Council will eventually take the hint, and I highly doubt that they don't have a way of killing a fairy god. <laughs>